Hi folks and welcome to the 20th video in my Getting Started series for the game B-17 Flying Fortress The Mighty Eighth. Now in this video we're going to be going through fighter school number 5 which is going to cover the German jet fighter, the Messerschmitt 262. The first combat jet aircraft to be actively used in World War II, the Messerschmitt 262, otherwise known as the ME 262, was faster than anything the Allies could put into the sky in 1944. It could rip through bomber formations and turn well at high speed, outperforming any pursuing escort fighter. However, its development and widespread use was stifled by the lack of competent pilots, the scarcity of fuel, and German failure to recognize its full combat potential at an early stage. When it did appear in October 1944, it was a stunning success. Heavy bomber gunners did not have time to aim, let alone fire, and even the fastest Allied fighter was left behind. Unfortunately, the ME-262 pilots were also unused to combat at such high speeds and often chose to slow down for the actual attack, and it was then that they were most vulnerable to conventional bomber defenses. Beware that the ME-262 is slow to accelerate and not very manoeuvrable. Allied pilots may try to attack you when you are most vulnerable, i.e. during takeoff and landing. But once airborne, the ME-262 could accelerate to a maximum speed of around 540 miles per hour, which is at least 100 miles per hour faster than any other Allied fighter in this game. Now, like most World War II fighters, there were many variants of the ME-262. However, the standard Schwalbe or Swallow production model included two fuselage mounted 30mm cannons above the nose and two fuselage mounted 30mm cannons towards the top sides of the nose. Now the large caliber and number of these cannons made them extremely effective at taking out their targets when hit. However, they also had a relatively short range of only 600 meters and when combined with a faster than normal closing speed of the ME-262, gave the pilots only around two seconds with which to aim and fire their guns before having to break away for another pass. This was clearly inadequate. As such, a new roller coaster tactic was devised. The 262s approached from astern and about 6,000 feet higher than the bombers. From about three miles out, they would go into a shallow dive that took them through the escort fighters with little risk of interception. When they were about one mile astern and 1500 feet below the bombers, they pulled up sharply to reduce their excess speed. On leveling off, they were about a thousand yards astern and overtaking the bombers by about 95 miles an hour, well placed to attack them. Later, anti-bomber versions of the ME-262 were equipped with 24 underwing mounted unguided rockets. Unfortunately, these are not modeled in this game. As you should know by now, I have been choosing a different airbase of interest for each one of these fighter schools. Now in this case, I have chosen the airbase of Leckfeld, located in Bavaria, southern Germany. Now the airbase was used not only by Messerschmitt as a test airbase, but Leckfeld was also where Adolf Galland made the first ever flight in an ME-262. He is reported to have told Hermann Goering that it felt like angels were pushing him. Also of note is that Heinz Barr was operating from Leckfeld, mostly alone, and had been very successful with the ME-262, and he finished the war with 16 victories, one of the two most successful jet pilots of the war. Now, Heinz Barr would, on 26th of April 1945, become commander of the elite ME-262 fighter unit, known as the Jagdverband 44, after Adolf Galland stepped down due to injury. Anyway, enough about the uh, airbase. Let's get on and have a good look over this ME-262. So welcome to the cockpit of the ME-262. Now before we do anything else, I'm just going to turn the heads up display in the top left off. So I'm just gonna hold down control and tap H on my keyboard to get rid of that. We don't need that right at this moment. So I'm just gonna start at the top of the cockpit here first of all, and we'll look at the gun sight to start with. So this gun sight is the typical German reflective Revy gun sight. And in this case, it utilizes fixed crosshairs and graduations. And as such, you will need to use your experience to lead shots accordingly. Now, the gun sight partially obscures the instrument panel, and as such, it can be moved out of the way when not in use, 
by left clicking this red button here. But first of all, we need to go into manual mode to do that. And we're going to do that by pressing the M key on the keyboard and we can see the icon changing to manual mode over here. So now in manual mode, I can left click on that red button and it moves the gun sight out of the way. So next we'll have a good look over the instrument panel. Now the instrument panel is split vertically into two main functions. And I'm going to show you that a bit more clearly now by holding down control and tapping P. And that now allows me to use the hat switch on my joystick to move the view down so we can see the entire instrument panel. So as I say, this is split vertically into two main functional groups. On the left, we have the flight instruments and that's these instruments over here. And on the right, we have all the engine and fuel instruments. As such, I'll focus on the left-hand side instruments first, followed by the left-hand side. Now, before we dive into the instruments, I just want to remind you that all of the instruments on the German planes are set up in metric units, whereas all of the Allied planes are set up in Imperial units. So just bear with that in mind. If you are using the overlay, for instance, that is set up in Imperial units. And so you may need to do a conversion if utilizing the German instrumentation and you're comparing that to the overlay, for instance. So now I'll just turn the overlay off once more, Control and H. So we'll start off at the top here with the top left instrument here, which is the airspeed indicator. Now the airspeed indicator displays the current indicated airspeed ranging from 100 to 900 kilometers per hour. Now the 800 and 900 markers are on a smaller diameter scale here. And remember that the top speed of the 262 is about 870 kilometers per hour, uh, which is equivalent to 540 miles per hour. Next up, we have the gyro horizon. Now the gy gyro horizon indicator indicates the longitudinal and lateral attitude of your plane relative to an artificial horizon. And it's the same type as used in the game for the BF-109 and the ME-190. Now this gyro horizon also includes a ball type bank indicator. Now this bank indicator is a liquid filled curved tube in which a free rolling inclinometer ball changes position according to the direction of the force of gravity and centrifugal force. The bank indicator is used to minimize side slip by the pilot, keeping the ball centered while turning. Now, just for your interest, the markings located on the outer handwheel of the gyro horizon have no function in this game. What they are, they indicate the direction the pilot would turn the wheel to either cage or uncage the gyro, with the bottom arrow indicating the current setting. The German words shown on the wheel are fest, roughly meaning fixed, and loss, roughly meaning loose. Now the game actually shows this in the wrong position. Fest is at the bottom, as can be seen here, below the arrow, which is the little white arrow there. And as such, this means the gyro is caged, when in fact it should be uncaged for normal flight. Now the extra instrument here is the rate of climb and descent indicator, or variometer. And this shows the rate of ascent or descent of the aircraft. Now this is graduated from zero to 30 meters per second in both climbing and descending directions. This is very close to the same range of 6,000 feet per minute used in the US aircraft in this game. Now this indicator is primarily used to maintain a constant altitude when turning and to establish a definite rate of climb or descent when flying on instruments. Next up we have the altimeter. Now the altimeter shows the current altitude above sea level. And there are three parts to this gauge. The main needle and scale, which covers a range from zero to one kilometer, and this is graduated in tenths of a kilometer or hundreds of meters. While the course scale is shown by a lower black dial, which you can just about make out behind the white needle there. And this indicates the number of full kilometers. However, this gauge has been incorrectly modeled in the game in two very different and two very bad ways. And unfortunately, it's the same for all of the German fighters in this game. Firstly, the altitude shown is a factor of 10 lower than it should be. Now in this example, you can see that the overlay shows the altitude as being 16,415 feet, which is around five kilometers. 
However, the altimeter shows an altitude of 0.5 kilometers. That is a tenth of what it should be. And secondly, the upper white dial was in reality what the pilot was set to the local barometric pressure and is graduated in millibars. However, Wayward Design got this one totally wrong and seemed to have believed that this was in fact an altitude measurement dial. In the game, this dial turns rapidly as one changes altitude. Very sloppy indeed. Now, bearing in mind these issues, I highly recommend using the heads up display. And I'll just remind you again that this is turned on and off by pressing the control and H keys on your keyboard. Now, the next flight instrument is the repeater compass. Now, like the US P51, the ME262 features a repeater compass, which in this case was electrically coupled to the master magnetic compass, which was located in the rear fuselage. The advantage of this type of compass was that it didn't float around and fluctuate when the aircraft was maneuvered compared to a conventional magnetic compass. Now below the repeater compass, we have the ammunition counters and the gun safety switch. Now in this game, it is only possible to fire all four of the 30 millimeter cannon simultaneously. And this can be done by pressing either the machine gun or the cannon firing controls. Also, both ammunition counters decrease simultaneously. And I'll just demonstrate that right now. And that's pressing the machine gun firing button. And that's pressing the cannon firing button. Now the switch between the two ammunition counters is the gun safety switch, which can be activated and deactivated by left clicking on it. And I'll just activate it there. Again, I'm pressing the cannon and machine gun firing buttons and the guns, the cannons do not fire. And if I left click on that switch again to turn off the safety switch, I can then fire the guns again. Now over to the left, we have the oxygen pressure gauge and oxygen flow indicator. Now these gauges are used to verify that there's an adequate flow of oxygen to the pilot. Now in this game, I don't believe the oxygen system and damage to it is actually modeled and I've never seen these gauges indicate anything other than normal indications when the engines are running. As such, I feel confident to say that they both can be safely ignored. So now we'll move over to the right hand side of the main instrument panel where we have the engine monitoring indicators. Now there are five indicators for each engine and these are arranged in a vertical stack. The left hand side for the left engine and the right hand side for the right engine. At the top are the dual range tachometers which have a lower range for starting. And you can just make it out here on this inner dial of zero to 3000 RPM and an upper range for flight of 2000 to 14,000 RPM indicated by the outer scale. The selection of which scale is used is achieved by using buttons located at the right hand side of the cockpit, which I'll cover in a short while. Now the tachometers effectively show the power output from the engine and they are adjusted by means of the throttle. Next up, we have the engine gauges. Now the following four per engine monitoring gauges can be safely ignored seeing as engine management for the fighters is not modeled in this game. However, when the engines are running, these gauges all seem to just show typical normal readings. The top two gauges cover the exhaust gas. Now the left one is the exhaust gas differential pressure and it's graduated from zero to one kilogram per centimeter squared. And the right gauge is the exhaust gas temperature and this is graduated from 300 to 1100 degrees centigrade. The bottom two gauges are the oil pressure gauge graduated from zero to 15 kilograms per centimeter squared and the fuel injection pressure gauge graduated from zero to 160 kilograms per centimeter squared. Now below the engine monitoring gauges, we have the fuel tank gauges. Now the left gauge is for the forward main tank while the right gauge is for the aft main tank. These gauges are graduated from zero to 1100 liters. To the left or right of each gauge, there are low fuel warning lights. Now according to Wikipedia, these lights illuminate when a fuel tank level reaches 250 liters, which is equivalent to 66 US gallons. However, in the game, the low fuel warning per main tank is set much lower at around 64 liters or 17 US gallons. 
and this gives the player only around six minutes warning before fuel runs out. Now the warning light comes on when the fuel tank gauge needle is well into the red zone. I'll discuss more about the fuel tanks when we get onto the fuel tank cock levers in a short while. So that's it for the main instrument panel. Let's now move on over to the left hand side of the cockpit. So I'll just swing us over there right now. There we go. So furthest aft here we have the rudder trim control. Now this can be set by either left clicking on it to move it to the left. And you can just see it moving very slowly there. Or right clicking on it to move it back in the opposite direction. And there is an indicator that shows the current rudder trim position. And that's this indicator here with the very thick white line. As always though, it is much easier to use the keyboard shortcuts for all of the trim functions. And so I highly recommend that you check out the reference card for the game and learn them from there. Now, moving forward, we have two throttle control handles, one for each engine. In practice, the throttles were equipped with minimum stops to prevent accidental full closure of the throttle and stalling of the engines. And this is replicated in the game so you can safely reduce the throttles to their minimum and the engines will continue to operate at minimum speed and do not stall. Now the throttle control handles are in effect used to set the engine speed and hence power from the engine to control airspeed. Now the throttles are fully animated via the game's throttle controls or you can use the mouse to move the handles by left clicking on them and moving the mouse up and down. I have noticed though that there is an issue with these throttle controls. Prior to starting the engines, the throttles do not respond properly to either the keyboard or joystick throttle commands. If the throttles are set to anything other than their minimum via the keyboard or joystick, then the throttle control handles move up to their maximum. And you can see that is the case here and they will not reduce back down again using the keyboard or joystick commands. And I've been trying to do that with my throttle control on my HOTUS here and those handles are not responding at all. So as such, if you are manually starting the engines, it is critical that you ensure these control handles are set to their minimum. And if they are not, then use the mouse to do so by left clicking on them and moving the mouse vertically down. And I'll do that right now. There we go. Note that there is no war emergency power associated with the Jumo jet engines on the ME262. And as such, when the throttles are set to 100%, this is the absolute maximum engine thrust that you can achieve. Now, to the right of the throttle control handles are the switch levers for the fuel cock batteries. Now, before I discuss these switch levers, let's talk about the fuel tanks first. Now the ME262 was equipped with a total fuel capacity of around 2,600 litres, which is 687 US gallons. And this was contained in four separate fuel tanks. There were two 900 litre or 240 US gallon main tanks, one forward and one aft of the cockpit. In addition, there were two auxiliary fuel tanks, a 200 litre or 53 US gallon forward auxiliary tank, and a 600 litre or 158 US gallon aft auxiliary tank. Now at a fuel burn rate of around 35 litres per minute, this gave this version of the ME262 an endurance of around 75 minutes. Now a critical issue though is that the engines could only be fed fuel from the main tanks and as such fuel from the auxiliary tanks had to be transferred to the main tanks to allow it to be used. However, fuel transfer from the auxiliary fuel tanks is not modelled in this game and as such I believe that Wayward Design accounted for availability of the auxiliary fuel capacity by reducing the fuel burn rate of the engines. However, they really appear to have significantly overdone this as the endurance of the ME262 in this game is around 2 hours compared to the one and a quarter hours that it actually should be. Now, getting back to these levers, which were used as both fuel cocks and for fuel tank selection. There are two levers and in real 262s, three positions. The left lever is for the left engine and the right lever is for the right hand engine. The three positions were fuel off when the levers were fully aft. In the mid position, fuel to the engine would be supplied from the aft fuel tank. And in the forward position, fuel would be supplied from the forward main tank. As such, it was possible to have each engine supplied from different main tanks. However, in this game, this has been simplified. The levers only have two positions, fully aft and fully forward. There is no mid position. 
In the aft position, the fuel supply is off. In the forward position, the fuel supply is on, with fuel being supplied equally from both main tanks. Now to move the levers, left click on it once to move it forward, and right click on it once to move it back. No, that in practice, fuel from the auxiliary tanks would have to be transferred to the main tanks using a push button switch, which was located in the main switch panel on the right hand side of the cockpit. This is also where the push button switches for the main fuel pumps were located. But neither of these switches are modeled in this game. Now to the right of the fuel cock levers, we have the elevator trim lever and the elevator trim position indicator. To apply positive elevator trim, simply right click on the elevator trim lever and keep the mouse button held down. And you can see it moving up very slowly there. And to reduce the amount of positive trim and to push the lever back down, you left click on it and hold, again, hold the mouse button down until you reach the desired setting. Unfortunately, you cannot apply negative elevator trim, despite the trim position indicator showing a scale below zero. This is the case whether you try and use this lever in the cockpit or you're using the trim keyboard shortcuts. To the left of the elevator trim position indicator is the main line switch. This is a toggle switch that turns electrical power on and off to the aircraft. It is simply activated by left clicking on it to turn it on and left clicking on it again to turn it off. And this is used during manual engine startup and shutdown. Now forward and to the left of the elevator trim position indicator are the flaps control buttons. And these are activated by left clicking on them. The lower else button deploys the flaps while the upper iron button retracts the flaps. Alternatively, you can use the keyboard shortcuts of Shift and F to deploy the flaps, and F alone to retract the flaps. Now, actual takeoff was with flaps at 20 degrees. However, partial flaps cannot be set in this game. Regardless, takeoff is easily achieved in this game with the flaps fully raised anyway. Now next to the flaps buttons are the landing gear push buttons. Ouse to lower the landing gear and Ein to raise the landing gear. Now the buttons are activated by left clicking on them. Alternatively, you can use the keyboard shortcuts of shift and the up arrow to lower the landing gear and the up arrow alone to raise the landing gear. And I won't do that obviously because we'll uh, collapse the plane onto the ground. Now the landing gear position indicators are provided for each unit and left is the main gear, the center is the nose gear and right is the right main gear. Now when else is displayed, as you can see here, the landing gear is fully lowered and when the landing gear is fully retracted, iron is displayed at the top of the indicators here. Now let's jump over to the jet orifice adjustment switch. Now this switch controls the exhaust area of the Jumo 004 jet engine, which featured a variable geometry nozzle. Now this nozzle had a special restrictive body and which was nicknamed the Zweibel, which is German for onion, due to its shape when seen from the side. Now the Zweibel could be moved forward and aft using this switch and it varied the exhaust exit area by between 20 and 25%. Now the Schweibel is set in the retracted position for starting to give greater area and help prevent overheating. Then it is moved aft to decrease the area and give greater exhaust velocity and thrust for takeoff and flying. Now originally the unit was supposed to move automatically over small ranges at extremely high speed and altitudes to give maximum efficiency. However, a simpler two position automatic operation was also implemented via a mechanical linkage with the throttle so that the bullet moved aft between seven and seven and a half thousand RPM. However, in other ME262s, the operation was manual via a switch as has been modeled in this game. Now I'll just illustrate the operation of the switch here. So we'll just have a quick look outside to see the exhaust at the moment. So we'll just do F2 to go outside and we'll move around to the exhaust of uh, the left-hand engine here. And you can see, so this is in the open position. So the exhaust has the largest um, area available. 
So now we'll pop back inside, we'll press F1. I shall activate that switch and we'll jump back outside very quickly. So there you can see that that has now closed in and you can no longer see the veins that were uh, visible there before. So I'll just uh, reopen that again. F1 to go inside, flick the switch, F2 to go outside. And there you can see that the uh, exhaust area has opened back up again as the dry bell has moved in. And you can kind of see that here. So that's in its uh, retracted position. And if I go back inside F1, and you can see it just moving out there to its extended position, which greatly restricts the exhaust orifice. So we'll just set that back to what it was before. And next up we have a compressed air pressure gauge. Now the compressed air system was used for emergency operation of the undercarriage and emergency operation of the flaps. And the gauge always shows a normal reading when the mainline switch is turned on. And then just moving up here, we have the emergency landing flap handle or lever. And uh, pulling this handle by left clicking on it uses the emergency compressed air system for emergency lowering of the flaps. And the handle above it is the emergency landing gear handle or lever. And pulling this handle by left clicking on it uses the emergency compressed air system for emergency operation of the undercarriage. And in practice, it would just lower the nose wheel and the main undercarriage fairing only. The undercarriage itself would fall under the influence of gravity. So now we'll move over to the middle of the cockpit and I'll just uh, move the view over so we can see here. So here we have the left and right rudder pedals which are animated when I activate the rudder controls. And in the middle here we have the control stick and that again is animated when I move my joystick uh, control around, my joystick control stick around. But again, you can't use the mouse to activate that at all. And there are two cannon firing buttons on the control stick that can again only be used via the keyboard or buttons mapped on your joystick. In this game, it doesn't matter if you press the machine gun or the cannon fire buttons, as all four cannons fire regardless of which buttons is pressed. And I'll just show those animated right now. So pressing the so-called machine gun buttons and pressing the cannon buttons there. Now we'll move the view over to the right hand side of the cockpit. And first of all, if I just move the view up a little bit, we can see the canopy release handle. And this is an emergency release and it causes the pilot to bail out of the aircraft. Now to bail out, you can either right click on this handle or you can use the keyboard shortcuts of holding down Control and Shift and B at the same time. Now this area down here is the electrical switchboard, which is just a graphical representation and it serves no function in this game. And if we move a little bit further back now, I'll just move the view a bit, we have the bomb release lever. Now the bomb release lever, while animated when left clicking on it, serves no purpose in this game as the 262 model is not equipped with any bombs. As we move down over here, we have a radio dial and this dial is part of the frequency control for radio communications. And again, it's just a graphical representation with no function in this game, so you can just ignore that. Now moving back, we have the two buttons here, and these are for selecting the scale used on the left and right RPM indicators. Now these are toggle buttons which are depressed and released by left clicking on them. I'll just left click once and left click again. Now when a button is in the down position, the RPM indicator uses the inner lower RPM scale. And if you remember, that's this inner scale here, which runs from zero to 3000 RPM. And when the switch is in the upper position, the RPM indicator uses the outside scale. So then it indicates whether the engine speed is anywhere between 2000 and 14,000 RPM. Now you use the button in the lowered position and the low RPM scale when you are starting up the engine and we'll go through that uh, when I go through the engine startup procedure. Next, as we move over to here, we have uh, two engine starting switches. We've got the left and the right. Now to activate one of these switches, the cover must first be opened by left clicking on it. And the switch is then activated by also left clicking on it. Both the cover and starter switch can be reset by clicking on them a second time. So I'll just left click on that and then that again. 
Now the function of these switches was to engage a clutch between the starter motor and the jet engine so that the engine would rotate at minimum speed under external power. It isn't until fuel is fed to the engines that they actually start. Well, that concludes the cockpit tour, folks. Now we'll move on to how to start up the engines and then we'll taxi and take off and then we'll turn around and we'll come back and land. So folks, welcome back to the standard view for, through the ME262 cockpit windows. And we're now going to run through the engine startup sequences. Now we'll do this in two ways, or I'll at least explain how to do it in two ways. And the first way is by using the AI to run through the startup sequence automatically for you. Now the first step in doing that is to press the M key on your keyboard to go into manual mode. And you can see the computer icon in the lower right has now changed to a hand to confirm that you are now in manual mode. Then because this is a two engine aircraft, you have to explicitly tell the game which engine you want to start up. You can only start up one at a time. So what you'll need to do is press the Q key on your keyboard to select the port engine, or you can press the W key on your keyboard to select the starboard engine. Now let's assume we're going to start up the port engine. You would press Q and then you would follow that by pressing the A key. Now the A key is the key that tells the game that you want to start up the selected engine and the game will now run through the startup sequence for that engine and it can take about 15 seconds from pressing the A key to the engine being ready for use. That is all the startup sequence is complete and the engine is running. You'll then have to repeat that sequence for the other engine. So you would do QA to start up the port engine, wait 15 seconds and then press W then A to start up the starboard engine and wait another 15 seconds. After that, you can then taxi and take off at your leisure. Now I'll run through the actual manual startup procedure for both engines. But before we do that, I'm actually just going to move the uh, view down. So I'll press Control P now, and that allows me to use the hat switch on my joystick to move the view down. Now I mentioned during the prior segment of the video that there is an issue with the throttle positions before engine, the engines are actually running. Now if I move my throttle control on the joystick up, or if you were to press the increase throttles key, which is the equals key at the top of the keyboard, then you'll see, fine, the throttles react and they move forward. Now if I reduce the throttles on my HOTA stick, or I press the minus key at the top of the keyboard, they do not respond. Now the problem with this is if you then start the engines up in this position, even if you have your HOTUS throttle stick all the way back at zero, because these throttles are showing fully forward, when you start the engines up, they will rev up to full power immediately and you'll start to slip off your stand and goodness knows what other trouble you'll get into. So what I recommend is that even if these throttles are already back in the zero position or whether they're up in this 100% position, always left click on them and drag your mouse down such that they are all the way back. Now let's say even if they are all the way back prior to doing that, left click on it and just move the mouse down. Now what this does, left clicking on it and moving the mouse down actually forces these throttles to be out of AI control and it forces the throttles when you start the engines to be at 0%, which is exactly what you need and want. So let's get on with the actual startup sequence itself now. So first of all, we'll press the mainline switch, which is just over here on the left hand side. And that turns electrical power on to the aircraft systems. And you can see that these gauges kick into gear here. So you, that gauge there and that gauge there both span around and are now indicating a value. So that means you've got confirmation of electrical power. The next step is to move over to the right hand side of the cockpit. And the first thing we need to do over here is to depress both of these RPM scale change buttons. So I'll just push both of those down, again, left clicking on them one at a time. And what that means is that when we start the engines and the RPM indicators here move up, they'll actually be utilizing the inner scale here, which is ranges from zero to 3000 RPM. And when you first start the engines up, they are only spinning at low RPM, hence the need to do this. So we'll start off with the uh, 
port site engine. So I'm going to remove the starter cover now and I'm going to do that by left clicking on it. And then I will left click on the starter switch here. So I'll do that. And you can hear the starter motor engaging on the engines. And that brings it up to about 800, 900 RPM. Now once it's there, you can then move over to the left hand side of the screen and you want to press the engine start button on the appropriate throttle control here. So there's one on the left hand side and there's one for the right hand side. So we're going to click on the left one. You can hear the engine tone changing and now the RPMs are increasing up to about 2000 RPM. Now we need to increase this throttle to about 10%. So I'm going to left click on it and move my mouse up and then very quickly click left click on the fuel cock there. Now you heard the engine tone change suddenly. As soon as that happens, you want to grab the throttle and put it back to zero. Otherwise you'll find that the ME262 starts to get dragged in a circle on its stand. Now we'll move over to the next engine. We'll work on the starboard engine. So we'll do just exactly the same. We'll left click on the starter cover. We'll left click on the right starter switch. We'll wait for the engine RPM to get up to about 800 RPM. We'll spin back over to this side. We'll click on the engine starter there. We'll wait for the RPMs to get up to about 2000. And then we'll push this up to about 10%. Turn on the fuel cock. And we just need to wait for that change in tone. If you don't get that change in tone, then you need to increase the throttle just slightly more. But again, don't forget as soon as you hear that change in engine tone, that you pull the throttle back down to zero. Now if we move over to the RPM indicators, we can see that they are actually off scale. They're well over 3000 RPM on each one. So what we're going to do now is we are going to press the two scale change buttons so that the RPM scale is now utilizing the outer scale here. So you can see that the minimum RPM when the engines are running is uh, just around three and a half thousand RPM. And the last thing we can now do is we can just close the starter covers by left clicking on them. Now one thing we'll need to do because we have gone through the manual startup sequence and we left clicked on the throttles over here, those throttles are now locked out from our external throttle controls. If I push the throttle up on my HOTUS as I have just done there, I get no response. If I press the increase throttle on the keyboard, the equals key, again I get no response. So what I need to do is to do what you do in the B, a similar thing in the B17s when you're in this situation. You have to quickly put the game back into AI mode and then you can quickly put it back into manual mode. So we'll do that right now and you do that by pressing the M key followed by the M key again. So M key puts us back into AI mode and the M key puts us back into manual mode. Now if I increase the throttle on my HOTUS or the keyboard you can see I get a, an instantaneous or an instant response I should say. So that's it. So that's the complete startup sequence. So again at the end of the startup sequence don't forget to press M and M to make sure that you have your throttle control um, operational. So I'm going to press control and P twice now to take us back to the locked upper view for the cockpit and we are ready to commence taxiing and taking off. Okay folks, so now we're ready to taxi. So let's uh, go to the external view by pressing the F2 key. And um, I just want to explore something here first of all. You'll notice that the 262 is actually wobbling around here. And it has in fact crept forward from its uh, original location. Now this is a bug in the game and it's, uh, this, it happens with all of the fighters in the game. That when you switch to manual mode, whether the engines are on or off, um, the planes wobble around a little bit and they creep forward and if I was to leave this long enough the 262 would keep moving forward and forward and forward and will just never stop. Uh, if I do go back into AI mode though and I'll press the M key to do so and just give it a moment and you can see now the 262 has stopped wobbling and no matter how long I leave it it will not move forward. Press M to go back into manual mode you can immediately see the towel dipped there 
Yeah, and that, that wobbling is going on again. So it's a bit of a bug. It happens with all of the fighters in the game, um, just so you're aware of that. So don't stay in manual mode uh, with any of these fighters on the ground for too long in one location. They will not stay still. Um, anyway, so let's um, start taxiing and taking off. We're going to taxi down here. And the end of the runway is over here. And the runway, runway I should say, runs all the way up there. Now you may notice that the 262 has a tricycle undercarriage arrangement. It has a nose wheel instead of a tail wheel. And the purpose of this is to keep the attitude of the engines horizontal so that the exhaust goes straight at the back and doesn't actually uh, point down to the runway as it would if there was a tail wheel. And the early prototypes actually did have a tail wheel um, and they had a lot of issues with taking off in that attitude with the exhaust pointing down to the walls of one way runway. So they actually changed the undercarriage arrangement to this tricycle arrangement so we have a nose wheel instead. Now you have to uh, unlock the nose wheel as you do with the tail wheels and the other fighters for taxiing so you, that you can turn but and you use exactly the same keyboard shortcuts so shift and T and there you see it actually says nose wheel release instead of tail wheel release which is nice. So we're then going to release the parking brake, shift P. And I'm just going to bring the throttle up and do a hard right hand turn using the yaw control on my uh, HOTUS. I'm gonna bring the overlay up, control and H, because we really should taxi somewhere between five to 10 miles an hour. We don't wanna taxi too fast. get ourselves uh, lined up for the end of the runway. There we go, it looks pretty good. Uh, throttle down to zero and set the parking brake. Okay folks, so that's us at the end of the runway. So we are now ready to uh, go through our pre-takeoff checklist. First thing we need to do is set the nose wheel uh, to its locked position again. So we're going to do that by pressing the T key to lock the nose wheel. Now we're gonna head inside. I'm gonna press the F1 key. And we are, first of all, we're going to move the gun sight out of the way. So one, it doesn't obscure the view out of the front of the cockpit. And also, so it doesn't obscure the top half of the variometer here. So I'm just gonna do that by left clicking on the red button there. And now I'm actually going to set the jet orifice adjustment switch into its uh, rear position. So I'm going to do control P so I can use a hat switch on my joystick to move the view around. And then I'm going to left click on the jet orifice adjustment switch. And if we look outside, we can see that the Zweibel has moved into its aft position. And uh, what that does is it restricts the orifice here such that it increases the thrust from the jet engines. Uh, and you do that for takeoff and normal flying around. It's only after you've started up and the engines are warming up uh, do you normally have the Zweibel in its forward position and that keeps the engines a little bit cooler and does, uh, does, prevents them from overheating, I should say. Now, as I, I've noted in this game that even with the Zweibel in its aft position, I've never noticed any change in thrust with these engines. So I'm only doing this to be pedantic as it's something that would have been done in practice. Uh, but within the game itself, you can completely ignore that if you wish to do so. So we have now moved the jet orifice back. I'm just gonna pop back inside and do control P twice just to bring the cockpit view back to its normal upper lock position. But I'm actually going to take off from the exterior view. So I'm going to do F2 again. Now before um, we move on, I'm actually going to uh, just talk a little bit, bit about the flaps again. You do not need to extend the flaps for takeoff with the 262s in this game. In practice, they would set them at 20 degrees, so just partial flaps. Um, but within this game, you can't set partial flaps. And so you can just safely leave the flaps fully retracted or fully raised uh, for takeoff. 
Um, the next thing to do is to just apply a little bit of left hand rudder trim. So I'm just going to hold down shift and tap insert once because I found that the 262s in this game do tend to veer off to the right as you move down the runway. Um, and that is a little bit weird because there's no torque effect from these engines. That is, you don't get the same torque effect you get from a single prop engine. Um, so I think there's a little bit wonky in the physics in this game in the way it's modeled. Uh, but it does always tend to veer off to the right as you accelerate down the runway. So applying a little bit of left rudder trim is necessary. So the next thing we're going to do is we're just going to bring the throttle up slowly. Um, I'm then going to release the parking brake and do any corrections using the, your control as we trundle down the runway. Now it's around 130 miles an hour um, that we've got sufficient speed for takeoff. So I'll start rotating and pulling back on my joystick um, around about 130 miles an hour. So here we go, throttles beginning to come up. Shift P. I'm just going to kind of mimic what they do in reality. I'm just bringing the throttle up slowly. They had to be very gentle with these engines due to the risk of overheating them. We're about 130 miles an hour, just rotating back now. And there we go. Landing gear up by pressing the up arrow and control backspace to eliminate that uh, rudder trim that we set. There we go, not a bad takeoff. Now just letting go of the joystick, because as we pick up speed, the rate, I found that the rate of climb of the 262 in the game does start to um, dramatically increase. If we go inside, and if we look at the variometer here, we'll see that rate of climb is increasing as our speed increases. So what I'm actually going to do is just throttle back a little bit until our RPM it's somewhere around just below 8,000 or around 8,000. And that should give us a fairly good rate of climb. So that's basically it, folks. Um, I'll, whoops, I didn't mean to do that. I'll just left click on that again to get it out of the way. F2 to go outside. Hey, look at that nice mountain range in the distance there. So um, I'll take us up to a normal cruising altitude um, and then I'll be back with you folks in a moment. So here we are folks, we're cruising at a, uh, an altitude of around 21, 22,000 feet and um, I would normally go through a few other features of the fighters at this point, namely the drop tanks um, on how to eject those and in the case of the 262 in this game there is no external fuel drop tank. Um, and so there's no need to go through that. Um, and the other piece I would normally cover is war emergency power. And as I mentioned in the prior video segment, uh, there's no war emergency power on the 262 in this game. The, the throttle being 100% is the maximum thrust uh, that you will get out of the uh, aircraft in this game. So uh, look at that beautiful mountain range down there, uh, lovely snow-capped peaks. And um, what we'll now do is we'll do a 180 degree turn and uh, we'll head back to the airbase. So here we go. Now that'll put us on a rough course to the airbase, but as with the other fighters the way to find your way back is to first of all head back inside oops, excuse me <laughs> Doing a bit of a wonky thing with my joystick there f1 to go back inside and we'll do control p and control p again to get back to the normal cockpit view you want to be in the standard locked cockpit views for this so i can now just use my hotus to go between the standard kind of locked cockpit views now what we're going to do is we're going to lock the camera onto the nearest airfield and we do that by doing holding down the shift key and tapping Y. And now the camera is pointing to the nearest airfield. And we're actually pointing quite nicely back to it, but what I'll do is I'll move away and turn away from the airfield a bit. 
and you can see that the camera has remained locked onto it, so it's off to our right hand side now. So again, I'll just turn back towards the right until we get the view centered. So I'm going to start to throttle back now. I'm going to bring the throttle back to about 50% just to begin our descent and to start to get rid of some of this excess speed that we clearly do not need for landing. So you can see the RPMs for the engines have dropped down to about 7,000 and our airspeed is just gradually declining there. So I'll keep us um, heading back to the airbase and I'll be back with you in a moment folks once we are on our final approach and we'll go through our final approach checklist. Okay folks, so we are on our final descent here, um, just about, just under a thousand feet. I'm just going to kind of bring that up a bit more stably. So I've been gradually reducing our speed. I've brought the RPM for the engines down to just over 6,000. And I've also been adjusting the elevator trim to allow our descent to be fairly nice and gradual. So I'm actually just going to put a bit more positive elevator trim on. I'm doing it using the fine control by holding down control and tapping home. And I'm just trying to get the variometer to, at the moment, just be fairly stable around zero so we don't lose any more altitude. I don't want to go below this altitude until I've got the airfield well in sight. At the moment it's not quite there, so I'm going to keep a close eye on the altitude and we are dropping off again. So a little bit of manual correction. You can see our speed's down to somewhere about 200 to 220. It'll probably vary around. That's not too bad an approach speed. I have found that when you do deploy the flaps, um, if you go much below 200, um, the aircraft will start to stall. And uh, so you, unfortunately you do need to land at a higher speed. This is what I found anyway, at a much higher speed in the 262 than in the uh, prop driven fighters. So um, just bear that in mind. Certainly experiment for yourself and if you manage to figure something uh, else out then let me know. Anyway, we've still got the camera locked onto the airfield so we are on course. I just don't want our altitude to drop off much more. I've got to be careful about the speed because <laughs> if I keep pushing the climb up too much we'll really lose speed and I don't want to do that. So. I'm actually just going to give the, us a little bit of thrust just to get us up a little bit higher. I'm not happy with that altitude at all. So bring the RPMs back down to just over 6,000. We'll check our side. There's the runway. Okay. The speed's looking quite good actually, 180, that's not a bad approach speed at all at the moment. So now I'm actually going to, in a moment, deploy the flaps, then I'll lower the landing gear and I'll lock the nose wheel. And I want to get lined up on the runway before I start doing that. So now it's probably good enough, shift F to deploy the flaps. Shift up arrow to lower the landing gear and then T to lock the nose wheel. If I go inside, I'm actually going to do Shift U to unlock the padlock view as well. Just in case you are using the cockpit view to land, make sure that you unlock the padlock view. Otherwise, you'll find your view from the cockpit going crazy as you uh, start to land on the runway. There's a very badly placed tree there. I don't know what idiot decided not to chop that one down, but that kind of, uh, that's not a very good place at all, is it? Okay, so that's a good enough landing, I think. Oh, I've bounced a little bit too much. Come on, come down, baby. All right, and now I'm gonna 
turn on the parking brakes because the 262 always generates a little bit of thrust so it takes an awful long time to actually um, decelerate and if you don't apply the parking brakes you will definitely run off the end of the runway so fantastic okay it's a bit of a bounce on that landing as you can see the speed does play a little bit of um, an issue here Oops, shift T to release the nose wheel and look at that <laughs> oh man I used up every inch of runway there didn't I okay so uh, just double check again shift T to release the nose wheel shift P to release the parking brake I'm going to uh, get rid of the trim on the plane control and backspace and um, now I'm going to do a sharp right hand turn and bring the throttle up we're just going to taxi back to the stand now. I'm also going to raise the flaps just by pressing the F key. One thing you have to bear in mind that all of this kind of dark green area is actually supposed to be a wooded area, a treed area, so <laughs> you can merrily taxi over the top of it, but um, technically you really shouldn't. Now, unfortunately I don't have a separate throttle control for, uh, certainly you can assign keyboards for them, a separate throttle control for each engine, so I'm just having to try and maneuver using both engines here. And I think that will probably do fine, so Okay, P to apply the parking brake, T to lock the nose wheel. And now we can shut the engines down in one of two ways. We can use the AI to do it in the same way that we had the AI start up the engines. And you can do that by using the engine selector key, Q, followed by S to stop the engine. And it will run through the shutdown sequence. And then you can follow that by W and then S to shut down the starboard engine. Now you need to wait for each engine to shut down fully before you command the next engine to do so. Um, the alternative is to go inside the cockpit to do control P and to bring the view down and then we'll swing over to the right hand side and what we'll do is we'll just actually cut off fuel to the engines. The throttle's already down to their minimum zero and so we will right click on each of the two fuel cocks there. And then the final shutdown piece will be just to turn off the mainline switch. And we can also move the spy bell into its forward position if we chose to do so, just so it's ready for startup the next time. Anyway, that's it folks. Um, I hope this video has been useful. Um, please let me know if you've got any comments in the comments section below. Uh, thank you very much for watching. Please uh, give me a thumbs up if you like this video. That uh, really helps me out. And uh, please subscribe. I've got uh, more videos like this coming up. Thank you very much for watching, folks. Take care. Bye-bye.